I just want to uh, say thank you uh, to Dr. Stephen Piper and Dr. Kendall for including me in the program. Um, what I would uh, just go through my disclosures quickly here so you can see that uh, I've had three companies that I've worked with um, and also received uh, some honorarium and travel expenses have been covered by these. And I am an employee of the University of Calgary. Uh, to mitigate any bias, the work that I'm presenting here today has largely been funded by our peer-reviewed National Health Agency and also a charitable foundation um, from Alberta. Um, the work is also derived from peer-reviewed publications. There is one exception to that. Uh, there's one study that we've performed in children that I want to just briefly highlight a few findings from, and this work was presented at the recent Experimental Biology Conference in Boston. So by way of introduction, I want to just very briefly mention gut microbiota and the link to insulin resistance and uh, type 2 diabetes. And as we can see, the interest in gut microbiota has um, flourished over the past decade. And we know that um, certainly scientists, as you know, highlighted by the Nature Special Edition completely on gut, gut microbiota, there has been uh, an exponential increase in the number of publications that are dealing with gut microbiota and their link to metabolic disease. But we also have the general public who is being exposed to this concept of gut microbiota and what the implication might be for their own health. And so we see just one from ABC News out of the United States, so anxiety in your head could come from your gut. And the number of conditions and diseases that have been linked to gut microbiota is, is increasing, and our understanding is increasing. So just very briefly to start with the concept of how did we link gut microbiota to metabolism. Um, we've also uh, heard previously, so Jeff Gordon had uh, some postdoctoral fellows working in his lab just approximately a decade ago who really laid some foundational work in the whole concept of gut microbiota linking to metabolism. And so what one of the postdocs did, Frederick Backhead, he took conventionally raised mice um, and he transplanted or took the gut microbiota from these animals and transplanted it into a germ-free animal who had lived its entire life uh, completely free from any bacterial contact. And very rapidly what they saw was that there was an increase in adipose tissues in these animals that had previously been germ-free but now were colonized with gut microbiota. Um, and what they saw was that these animals were now able to harvest more energy from the diet that they were consuming, and they were also able to identify very specific um, pathways that are involved in energy storage. And so we, we could now see that gut microbiota um, play a role in energy metabolism and in energy balance. Um, in, in the same lab, uh, Dr. Gordon also had another postdoctoral fellow who then went on to link the gut microbiota to obesity itself. And so what the initial findings or um, observations were that if you have uh, genetically lean and obese mice, there's a very distinct profile between these two phenotypes or genotypes uh, in these animals. And at that time, the, the major finding was at the phylum level. And what we saw was that in the obese animals, there was an increase in the Firmicutes phylum and a decrease in the Bacteroidetes. Um, they then also looked, does this uh, apply to what we see in common obesity in, in humans? And indeed it was. Um, they saw that obese humans display an altered microbial profile and that this microbial profile could actually be changed if those individuals were put on a diet and lost weight. And so what we now know is that this uh, profile, this obese profile for the microbiota is much more complex then um, just changes at the phylum level. And so some of um, the, we're getting deeper and deeper into our understanding of what really constitutes um, uh, a microbiota profile that is, as we call it, 
dysbiotic or in uh, no longer healthy balance. And so then finally, um, another group uh, in Belgium, um, the Kenai and Delsen group, really were looking for a causative agent. So what is it about the gut microbiota that might be linking them to metabolic disease and then uh, triggering type two, uh, type 2 diabetes? And what they found was that there is a specific component um, the cell wall component of gram-negative bacteria called lipopolysaccharide. And this was identified to be an inflammatory trigger for insulin resistance and then subsequent di um, diabetes. And so what they coined the term metabolic endotoxemia. So you have a leaky gut, whereas normally the uh, barrier, the gut barrier is very well, uh, has good integrity and is tight. When you feed a high fat, this is lard, and a high fat, high sugar diet, you compromise that barrier. And those endotoxin, the lipopolysaccharide from the bacteria is able to translocate into the circulation and then can trigger the insulin uh, resistance. And the interesting thing is that certain uh, bacterial groups uh, are more protective uh, and some are certainly more uh, harmful. So they saw that bifidobacterium was negatively correlated with the endotoxemia. So if you could increase the abundance of the bifidobacteria, you could create a better barrier in the gut and reduce this um, translocation of the LPS into um, the intestine. So with this background of the importance of gut microbiota into metabolic disease, then of course the $6 million question becomes, if we know there's dysbiosis, a, a, disturbance in the microbiota profile, is there a way to bring it back to what we hope to one day identify as a healthy profile? It's difficult to, to know exactly what a healthy profile is, but is there something we can do dietary-wise to, to do that? And of course, prebiotics um, fit that bill um, for several reasons, and they're actually defined as a selectively fermented ingredient that can then change the composition or the activity of the, the gut microbiota. And the key thing is that then it will confer a health benefit onto the host. And so we can get prebiotic from you know, certain low levels from foods we consume. Um, but in essence, the vast majority of the studies that have been performed with prebiotic are looking at it in supplemental form. So it's difficult to get sufficient amounts from the, the diet, just eating those foods, to really get a, a therapeutic effect here. So we've done a lot of work in uh, rodent models, some of those with pregnancy, which would be really uh, interesting and relevant for a talk on gestational diabetes. But today what I'd like to do is really focus in on the, the human clinical evidence that we have for the health benefits of prebiotic fiber. And um, uh, another day we could uh, talk about some of the really interesting other work that is being done with uh, prebiotics. So what I'd like to do, there, there's some classical or really well-established effects of the prebiotics, some of the first effects that were looked at, and that's really in terms of energy intake. So satiety, your, your feeling, your appetite feelings, and the gut hormones, and then uh, certainly following with that is weight loss. But there's some other metabolic benefits that probably haven't received quite as much attention. And for that, I'd like to focus in on glycemia, lipid metabolism, and then inflammation. So just to uh, give you two brief examples of the effect of prebiotic fiber on appetite, um, this is a study we did six years ago. And here we gave a, a fairly high dose of prebiotic. We used oligofructose here at 21 grams per day. And what we saw was that over the three months that the individuals either consumed the prebiotic or the placebo, the control, was that they self-reported, and again, we, we've heard about the problems with self-reporting, but we did do a weighed three-day food record in these individuals repeatedly. And as you can see, the bottom line represents those that had consumed the oligofructose. And so compared to their baseline, they report consuming less energy throughout the study. And at the six-week time point, it was actually significantly uh, lower than what the placebo group was um, doing. And so what could be some of the mechanisms? And there's been a, a, a big body of literature that has looked at the appetite hormones, the gut hormones. And in this study, we saw that there was increased PYY in these individuals and decreased ghrelin or the hunger hormone. 
Um, the group of Del Sen and, and Kanai, they looked at the subjective ratings of appetite. And here they used a, a, a bit lower dose. It was 16 grams per day. And so this was in healthy individuals. I should just mention that um, our study was in overweight and obese adults. This one was with healthy adults. And when they gave the oligofructose for two weeks, what they saw was following a breakfast that those who had consumed the oligofructose had a much higher rating of their satiety. And they followed them throughout the day. And by the time the dinner meal came, they also saw that these subjects were still reporting higher satiety, lower hunger, and when you ask the subjects, how much do you think you could eat, their prospective food consumption, these individuals were saying, I could eat less compared to those who were given the placebo. So if we can control or manage our appetite more effectively, does that have any effect on weight loss is, is the key question. And so again, I'll just present from our study with the overweight and obese adults that um, indeed, we see a significant decrease in body weight. The majority of that weight is coming from fat mass. And in animal studies, it's very interesting. We've seen almost this selective uh, reduction adiposity. And lean mass is beautifully preserved in, in animal models. And, and here we see, again, that the majority of that weight loss is from fat mass and a good portion from trunk fat. Now, I'll just highlight that the placebo group actually gained a small amount of weight during this time. And this is very typical um, that if you, um, you know, I liked Dr. Tim Church's analogy where he said that in his subjects, if you do nothing, they will not be level, the type 2 diabetes, they will continue to deteriorate. And the same thing we see with body weight. If you do nothing, individuals, adults, will typically gain approximately one kilogram per year. And we, we saw that very nicely in our study in the placebo group. So the prebiotic could stop that gradual adult weight gain and, and cause a bit of reduction uh, in weight and certainly in, in the fat mass. So even though small um, magnitude, probably important in halting weight gain. So here's where I just want to highlight what we've seen in children, because there's been very little work um, looking at overweight and obese children with prebiotic. And so we were very interested to know, does this have an impact on their uh, body fat? And what we see is that the placebo, these, these children continue to grow, they continue to gain weight. Um, so this was over four months that we followed them. We gave them a fairly low dose for, for children. It was eight grams per day that we gave them. And what you can see is that the change in total body weight was significantly reduced in the children who got the prebiotic. Um, and importantly, we see that this was um, a, a good reduction in their central or their trunk fat. So if we go to the metabolic e effects, first let's go to glycemia. And um, there's been a really nice systematic review meta-analysis uh, that was published last year in 2014. And here you can see we have four studies that met the uh, criteria for inclusion to look at glycemia. And what we see is that uh, the standardized mean difference uh, favored the prebiotics, so the postprandial glucose concentrations were reduced with prebiotics, so negative 0.76. And um, if we then also look at the insulinemia, uh, three studies were included here, and a uh, very similar outcome that the postprandial insulin concentrations are also reduced. Now, it, it's important to note that in this meta-analysis, there were no changes in the fasting glucose or the fasting insulin, therefore ho HOMA IR was not different, and they didn't see any changes in the hemoglobin A1C. But certainly postprandially, uh, the glucose and the insulin, uh, we have fairly robust data to say it is reduced. So then if we look at, uh, move on to lipid metabolism, uh, you can see that there's quite a few more studies that have actually looked at lipid metabolism and prebiotic intake. And importantly, these studies that are listed here, they include healthy individuals, they include overweight individuals, and there's some studies in there with hypercholesterolemic individuals. Um, and I've just uh, pulled out the triglycerides, um, Valium, there was really, really no change here, so the um, standardized mean difference was negative 0.11, but this was not significant for triglycerides. Um, and they also were not able to detect a change for total or LDL cholesterol. One interesting thing is that uh, when you look through the studies with the lipid profile, most of those use a, a relatively lower dose of the prebiotic. So a lot of these use 8 to 10 grams 
of prebiotic in their interventions, whereas the studies that I've presented for satiety, uh, weight loss, whatnot, those are typically higher with 15 to 20, we did 21 grams. So maybe a bit of difference there with the dose in, in the outcomes. And so then finally, I just want to briefly mention a couple things about inflammation. And certainly inflammation is, is um, getting its uh, time in the spotlight. And there's been calls, uh, this is just a Nature Reviews, where they're saying that maybe it's time to look more closely at uh, targeting inflammation and looking at how can we treat inflammation in metabolic disease and type 2 diabetes. And so from the studies that have perf been performed with um, prebiotic fiber, we see for C-reactive protein, three out of the four studies have shown a significant reduction. Uh, these have been in obese adults, and there was one study, uh, women with type 2 diabetes. For TNF, alpha, and IL-6, the, the this kind of uh, contradictory results amongst the studies that have been published. And then plasma LPS, remember that the bacterial endotoxin that can translocate into the system and trigger um, insulin resistance. So here there's been two studies. Uh, they both saw a significant reduction, one in healthy adults and then one in the women with type 2 diabetes. Um, we then went back um, to our study with the 21 grams of oligofructose in overweight and obese adults, and we looked at uh, the, the cytokine profile, inflammatory marker profile in these individuals, and what we see was also confirming a significant decrease in LPS levels compared to the placebo who had a slight increase. And then um, plasminogen activator inhibitor one is a coagulation factor. And what we saw was that there was a significantly greater decrease in the prebiotic individuals compared to those who had received the uh, control. And then finally, um, just again briefly, what, what happens in children, these, these children were overweight and obese. Their percent body fat uh, was 42%. So these are, are children who um, uh, metabolically are very unhealthy. And what we could see was that there was a slight increase in IL-6 in the children in the control group and a significant decrease in IL-6 levels in uh, the children with the prebiotic intake. And then CRP, you kind of see the same pattern, but that wasn't uh, significant. So in conclusion, uh, there's very good evidence that prebiotic fiber enhances satiety. Um, the individual studies have been able to show weight reduction, body fat production, but if you do the meta-analysis, those did not come out as significant. Um, prebiotic fiber also reduces postprandial glucose and insulin. Um, however, there weren't changes for some of the other indicators of glucose control. And finally, prebiotic fiber is a potential target for inflammation, and I think we're going to see more work in this area, and the evidence is accumulating for that. So thank you.